scandalous intimacy obsessed medieval nuns in Little Moor from March 2014 to December 2015. Archaeologists discovered the skeletons of a number of carnal intimacy-obsessed scandalous nuns who were eventually punished for their sins by having their priory dissolved, and their prior is pensioned off. The team of archaeologists from John Moore Heritage Services discovered the skeletons of a total of 92 nuns at Little Moor Priory in Oxfordshire, dating from the time the priory was founded in the 11th century to its dissolution by Cardinal Wolsey in 1525. The Little Moor Priory intimate scandals took place between 1517 and 1518, involving accusations of intimate immorality among the Benedictine nuns and the priors that shocked medieval England. On June 17, 1517, Little Moor Priory was visited by Dr. Eden Horde, a commissary of Bishop William Atwater of Lincoln, accompanied by the Episcopal Chancellor Richard Ross Tun. While what triggered the impromptu visit is unknown to this day, what they saw at the nunnery under its prior is Catherine well scared the bejesus out of them. The prior herself was embroiled in her own intimate scandal with accusations of having an illegitimate daughter, and was still visited by the child's father, Richard Hughes, a priest in Kent, with whom she drank and romped occasionally within the nunnery. Crazy nuns at Littlemore Priory the skeletons were found in a burial ground surrounding the site of the priory, which was being used for the construction of a new hotel. Burials within the church are likely to represent wealthy or eminent individuals, nuns, and prioresses, said Paul Murray, leader of the team. Those buried outside most likely represent the laity with a general desire to be buried as close to the religious heart of the church as possible. Most of the burials were female, 35 individuals in total. Another 28 were male, with a final 29 remaining unidentifiable. A 45-year-old female who had been buried in a stone coffin at the center of the cross of the transept in the old priory was probably the prioress. Some of the skeletons displayed signs of disease, including leprosy, while two children suffered from developmental dysplasia of the hip. The archaeologists also found a stillborn baby in a casket and a woman buried face down. Mr. Murray said that the face down position was probably a penitential act to atone for her sins. She may, therefore, have been one of the sinful nuns who had, according to surviving records, provoked Cardinal Wolsey into dissolving the priory and pensioning off the prioress. Eileen Power mentions the priory in her book's Medieval English Nunneries as one of the worst establishments in the country at the time. Another report written in 1445, and quoted in the Daily Mail said the sleeping quarters were so ruinous that nuns were afraid to sleep there, and that the nuns were sleeping two to a bed, with even the prioress having to share her bed. According to W. H. Page's A History of the County of Oxford, Littlemore Priory was a Benedictine house founded by Robert de Sanford, a knight in the service of the Abbot of Abingdon. The priory was constructed on pasture land in the village of Sanford during the reign of King Stephen and was initially named Sanford Priory, acquiring the name Littlemore from the mid-13th century. It received royal favour from Henry III during the early years of his reign but was dissolved in 1525 by Henry VIII. A question that is raised from all the accounts of the priory is how unusual was the lewd behavior of the nuns and priors at Little Moor. Examples of nuns acting against their vows are plentiful. Many of these women had entered the nunneries and convents at a young age and not through choice. Parents would send their girls to become nuns for financial or moral reasons. Maybe the girl was bringing shame on her family or even as a pawn in a game of power. Abbesses were influential figures in medieval England, and so having an abbess in the family was definitely a bonus. So it is not surprising that as these girls grew up, some of them rebelled against the constrictive and stifling life they had been condemned to. Secret confessor claimed their acts were spiritual rather than lustful. One of the confessors at Sant'Ambrogio harbored a secret, he was living under an assumed name. He was actually Joseph Kloitgen, an advisor to the Pope and a leading theologian. In 1848, Kloitgen began an affair with one of the nuns, 
and during the Inquisition trial, the confessor admitted that he had multiple carnal encounters with Maria Luisa. Kloygan tried to defend himself. Their affair, he insisted, was purely spiritual, not about lust, Kloygan claimed, but about religion. Even though he confessed, Kloygan suffered only mild punishment, the Inquisition ordered him confined to a Jesuit house for two years, and he was stripped of any role in hearing confessions. Maria Luisa introduced some unorthodox practices to new nuns, including sexual initiation rites. Maria Luisa told the nuns that her bodily fluids contained divine blessings, which could be shared during climax. During the trial, Maria Luisa admitted that the Tsentli founder of the order, Fer Io, used similar methods to pass on her miraculous liquor to Maria Luisa and former novices. Novices were invited to spend the night in Maria Luisa's cell. If any of the nuns complained about the rituals, they mysteriously took ill and died. Princess Katerina von Hohenzollern Sigmaringen was widowed twice by age 36. Rather than remain in her native Germany, the princess became enamored with Rome's convent of Sant'Ambrogio and decided to become a nun. Not long after, however, the princess uncovered some suspicious behavior and soon feared for her life. The princess smuggled out a cryptic letter that simply read, Save me. After she discovered the abbess's illicit and controlling behavior, she believed Maria Luisa was slowly trying to kill her. During the Inquisition trial, Maria Luisa was accused of participating in lesbian encounters, venerating a false saint, and murder. But one crime in particular stood out during her trial. According to witnesses, Maria Luisa had engaged in what was termed a Jesuit blessing, but was actually an erotic ceremony. The secret blessing, passed down from the convent's founder Maria Agnes Fer Io, consisted of French kissing, among other things. One witness said that the male confessor made the sign of the cross on her throat with his tongue. Sometimes he put his tongue into the penitent's mouth and kissed her on the heart. While receiving thy blessing, nuns sometimes fell into a state of ecstasy on their knees before the confessor. Maria Luisa shared an erotic letter with the convent's newest recruit, the twice-widowed German Princess Katerina. But when the princess reacted with shock, Maria Luisa decided to eliminate the critic in the most permanent way. Maria Luisa used forged letters from the Virgin Mary to justify her actions. The heavenly instructions, Maria Luisa claimed, told her to end Katerina's life. Many attempts were made, though none were successful. Princess Katerina managed to escape the convent with the help of her cousin. Seriously ill and refusing all food and medicine, Katerina was taken to her family's French estate to recover. Maria Luisa later confessed that she had made the princess ingest opium, mercury, and powdered glass. Brutal Nun Punishments Stories of nuns having relationships and children, usually with male priests, often they themselves had been pushed into a lifetime of celibacy against their natural instincts, abound in literature and folklore. The punishment for such immoral behavior was severe but did not usually result in their deaths. Walled-up nuns and priests became a trope in Gothic literature but were hardly if ever practiced in Britain. Nuns who took a lover were forgiven as long as they repented of their sins. Catherine Wells was heavily appropriating the nunnery's meager funds and had pawned all the nunnery's ornaments to support her extravagant lifestyle. She was brutal in punishments, and any nun opposing her would be banished to a closed room without food and drink for several days. As the nuns complained against the prioress, accusations and counter-accusations started to fly, with Catherine blaming the other nuns of immoral behavior themselves. Clandestine intimate relationships were not the sole purview of the prioress, at least one other nun, probably Juliana Winter, had also had a child by John Wexley, a married Oxford scholar two years previously. For their part, the nuns complained to Horde that Wells was a brutal disciplinarian. When they tried to broach the subject with her, she would have them put in the stocks. 
the historian Valerie G. Spears has suggested Wells was obsessed with discipline. On one hand, this was self-defeating, and on the other, encouraged by the nun's civility. Horde heard that such a state of affairs was damaging recruitment. Women who may have been thinking of taking the veil at little more saw the conditions they would be expected to live under and went elsewhere instead. It was claimed on at least one occasion a potential recruit had not only walked out immediately, but had proceeded to advertise the poor state of the priory throughout Oxford. Potential benefactors were also being deterred. The church historian Philip Hughes suggests that nuns demanded that Horde remedy their complaints. They had requested permission to leave the house for another if he could not, possibly out of fear of Wells' expected retribution after he had left little more. Circumstances appear not to have changed over the next year. On September 2, 1518, Atwater visited little more personally. Although he had to bring about some reformation at little more, the bishop was disappointed. On this visit, Wells complained to him that nuns refused to obey her. She reported that Elizabeth Winter played and romped in the cloister with men from Oxford, and by her sisters, had defied the prioress's attempts to correct her. For example, the prioress explained she had put Elizabeth in the parlour stocks only for three of her colleagues, the two other Winter sisters, and one Anna Willey to break the door open and release her. Wells must have locked Winter in, as her rescuers broke the lock as well. The four of them then set fire to the stocks and barricaded the door against Wells. She summoned aid from neighbors and servants, but before help could arrive, the nuns had broken the window and escaped into a nearby village. There they hid with a sympathetic neighbor, one English shape, for some weeks and repostulatized. The wild mistress of novices ordered nuns to sleep with her. In the 1850s, the founder of the convent of Sant'Ambrogio, Fur Rao, was stripped of her abbess title for encouraging other nuns to worship her as a false idol. Mistress of novices Maria Luisa overtook Fur Rao's role, and, just as her predecessor, she arranged nightly rendezvous with her novices. One nun confessed, Maria Luisa, asked me to lie in a certain position, with my legs raised, while she entwined herself with me. She then made movements and a sound such as I cannot express in words, as she instructed me to position myself so that I could receive her bodily fluids into me. Maria Luisa claimed that these fluids could cure illnesses. She also asked the novices to lay face to face and breast to breast with her as part of their initiation ritual. The convent's founder, Maria Agnes Ferraio, was involved in several scandals during the early 19th century. Although she had been a spiritual advisor to Pope Leo XII, Ferraio found herself in hot water when her misdeeds became public. Ferraio not only had an affair with her confessor, but she also engaged in a three-way tryst with her confessor and another nun. She performed false miracles and had two abortions when she became pregnant by clerical officials. Miraculously, Maria Agnes's convent wasn't shut down by the Inquisition in 1816 when she was stripped of her title as abbess. Instead, the illicit activity continued behind closed doors. Mistress of novices Maria Luisa wasn't just sleeping with the other nuns, she was also carrying on with one of the convent's Jesuit confessors. When the two met up at night, they shook off suspicion by citing reasons of religious communing. In fact, Maria Luisa managed to con the confessor into bed using forged letters from the Virgin Mary. Maria Luisa asked a novice, Maria Francesca, to write the holy letters because of her beautiful handwriting, and soon everyone in the convent was following the holy orders, including the confessor who jumped into bed with Maria Luisa. He dirty secret sex lives of St. Ambrogio nuns in the quiet town of Sant'Ambrojo, where the gentle tolling of church bells filled the air, a seemingly idyllic convent stood as a symbol of spiritual devotion and purity. The nuns of Sant'Ambrojo were revered by the townspeople, their veiled figures seen as ethereal beings dedicated to a life of prayer and holiness. But behind the cloistered walls of this seemingly peaceful haven, a web of secrets, scandals, 
and dark desires was about to unravel. Welcome to the enigmatic world of the nuns of Santun Broho, a captivating tale of faith, betrayal, and the human condition. Prepare to embark on a journey that will take you beyond the serene facade of religious devotion, delving into the hidden recesses of the human heart and the twisted dynamics of a cloistered community. Within the hallowed halls of the convent where silence reigned supreme and prayers echoed through stone corridors, a mysterious sister named Maria Luisa captivated the hearts and minds of her fellow nuns. Her ethereal beauty, coupled with her alleged visions and prophesies, elevated her to a position of power and influence. Prepare to be enthralled by the stories of forbidden love, where vows of chastity were broken and passions ran wild in the most unlikely of places. Witness the complex interplay of faith and desire as the nuns grappled with the conflict between their sacred vows and the undeniable pull of human connection. Crazy Life of Nun Juliana Winter As a result, they had also been persistently disrespectful during the mass, playing games, chattering, and laughing loudly throughout, acting with generally wanton behavior even at the elevation, despite their supposed obedience to attentiveness and decorum. Wells complained that even though it had been two years since Juliana Winter had given birth, she had learned nothing of the errors of her ways and still eagerly sought the company of men. The nuns, for their part, complained that the prioress had sold off all their wood and the Hughes had stayed with the prioress for over five months. Few months following his visit, Bishop Atwater summoned Catherine Wells to his court in Lincoln. She faced numerous charges, including incontinence and deliberate immorality. Booker says the proceedings lasted several days during which she was interrogated by both the bishop and his officials, including Dr. Peter Potkin, the Episcopal canonist at council. At first, Wells denied the accusations, but the weight of Horde's evidence forced a confession. She revealed her daughter had died in 1513 and that she had given Richard Hughes some of the priory silver plate since then, including a silver goblet worth five marks. She claimed to have maintained the same lifestyle for the previous eight years, but that no one had inquired into Little Moore's affairs in all that time. Rather, she said the priory had had no contact with the Fissile Church except for one occasion when she had received some ecclesiastical injunctions a few years before. On the final day of the hearing, Atwater gathered the evidence and pronounced his judgment. As punishment, Wells was dismissed from her office, although she was permitted to carry out the day-to-day -day duties the house required until a replacement had been organized. This was on the strict condition that she would do nothing apart from this without Horde's personal authorization, especially in regard to matters of internal discipline. That little more had proved itself intractable, unable to reform it, or to allow itself to be reformed probably made it a likely candidate for dissolution. Convent was founded by a nun with an iron mask. Sant'Ambrogio was a relatively new convent when it began hiding its crimes. The organization was founded in 1806 by a young nun in her early thirties. Sister Maria Agnes Ferrao built a powerful reputation, she was known for wearing an iron mask, outfitted in over fifty nails that pointed toward her face. The founder may have claimed she was a living saint, but her stigmata were self-inflicted. On top of that, the Inquisition put Ferrao on trial in 1816, and she was convicted. The charges were feigned holiness and lewd behavior with her confessor. Ferrao spent the rest of her life in banishment. Although Ferrao's convent managed to stay open, the Inquisition may have been looking for an excuse to close it. Even after an Inquisition trial, the secrets of Sant'Ambrogio never became public. Pope Pius IX likely worried about the backlash that would ensue if the church admitted to fornicating nuns and murder plots. The convent was quietly closed forever, and Maria Luisa was sentenced to monastic confinement for twenty years. Princess Caterina, who never found the spiritual home she sought in Rome, went home to Germany and poured her wealth into a local monastery named Buron. Pope Pius IX stepped in when he heard of Princess Caterina's denunciation, 
though he also helped cover up the entire scandal. Pius IX was worried that the affair, centered on a convent in Rome not far from the Vatican, could tarnish the reputation of his allies. So, instead of a public trial, the case was sent to the Holy Office of the Roman Inquisition. When the trial revealed lesbian encounters and attempted murder, the Inquisition quickly tried to cover up the entire scandal. The convent was closed, the abbess was sentenced to 20 years of confinement, and the men involved were each given two years in prison. Once upon a time in the small town of Santan Brojo in Italy, there existed a convent that held a dark secret. The convent known as Santan Brojo was home to a group of nuns who were revered for their piety and devotion to God. Little did the townspeople know, behind the cloistered walls, a web of corruption and scandal was unraveling. At the heart of the story was Sister Maria, a young and innocent nun who had recently joined the convent. She was captivated by the serene beauty of Santan Brojo and the devoutness of the nuns. However, as she delved deeper into convent life, she began to uncover a series of shocking events that would shake her faith to its core. It all began with whispers and hushed conversations that Sister Maria overheard in the corridors. Tales of secret affairs, forbidden love, and even murder circulated among the sisters. Intrigued and filled with a mix of curiosity and trepidation, Sister Maria embarked on a quest to uncover the truth. Her investigations led her to Sister Agnes, a mysterious and enigmatic figure within the convent. Sister Agnes possessed a charm and charisma that drew people to her, but Sister Maria sensed something dark lurking beneath her facade. Determined to unravel the truth, Sister Maria befriended Sister Agnes, gaining her trust and uncovering the secrets hidden within the convent's walls. As Sister Maria dug deeper, she discovered a clandestine network of relationships and scandals involving the nuns and even the convent's priests. Lust, jealousy, and power struggles tainted the once pious atmosphere of Santan Brojo. Sister Maria found herself torn between her duty to the church and her desire for justice. As the scandal unfolded, it became apparent that the web of deceit extended beyond mere romantic entanglements. Darker secrets emerged, revealing a world of power struggles, manipulation, and even murder. The nuns' actions were driven by a hunger for influence and control as they plotted against one another in a bid to rise to positions of authority within the convent. In their quest for power, the nuns resorted to heinous acts, including poisoning their rivals and engaging in occult practices. The convent, once a symbol of spiritual solace, became a hotbed of treachery and wickedness. The town, shocked and appalled by the revelations, struggled to reconcile the actions of those they had held in such high esteem. With each revelation, Sister Maria's faith wavered, but her determination to expose the truth grew stronger. She sought the help of a local journalist, Giovanni, who shared her belief in the importance of shining a light on the corruption within the church. Together, they worked tirelessly to gather evidence and expose the sins of Santan Brojo. Their efforts were met with resistance from the powerful and influential figures associated with the convent. Threats and intimidation followed their every step, but Sister Maria and Giovanni remained resolute. They knew that the truth must prevail, regardless of the consequences. Some files in the Vatican archive uncovered the scandal. For decades, the Catholic Church hid the scandal at Sant'Ambrogio. The Inquisition records were buried in a secret archive, which was not open to the public. All this changed, However, when scholars gained access to the materials, and one in particular uncovered Maria Louise's scandalous behavior. Hubert Wolfe, a history professor at the University of Munster, discovered the scandal at Sant'Ambrogio hidden deep in Vatican records. Wolfe was one of the first scholars to gain access to one secret Inquisition archives. Although it pales in comparison to confessions of sexual misconduct and attempted murder, the nuns of Sant'Ambrogio were also punished for insisting that a false scent was holy. Maria Agnes Ferraio, the founder of Sant'Ambrogio who was called a false saint by the Roman Inquisition, 
was honored behind convent walls. Princess Katerina was horrified to learn of the illicit worship. They showed me her scourges and other instruments of mortification, and told me of the three pounds of raw flesh that fell from the mother after a single flagellation. They always praised her extraordinary virtue, the princess confessed. In this convent they don't even blush when they proclaim the holiness of Sister Maria Agnes, she surpasses almost all other saints. As the case of Sant'Ambrogio was personal for the inquisitors, that the convent was targeted during the Inquisition is no surprise. The nuns of Sant'Ambrogio vocally attacked the Inquisition. The Catholic institution had ruled that the convent's founder, Maria Agnes Ferrao, was guilty of false holiness. But inside the walls of Sant'Ambrogio, the nuns loudly proclaimed that the Inquisition was wrong. To these nuns, Agnes Ferrao was a saint, and they collected relics such as her clothes, embroidery, and images of the woman. They named their founder her joy, her treasure, the brightest of her stars. In a dramatic climax, the scandal of Santun Broho was brought to light. The secrets that had festered within the convent for years were exposed, causing shockwaves throughout the town and beyond. The nuns of Santun Broho, once seen as paragons of virtue, became figures of disgrace and shame. As the scandal reverberated throughout the town, the repercussions were felt far and wide. The revelation shook the foundations of the convent, the church, and even the faith of the townspeople. Many were left questioning the institutions they had once trusted implicitly. The aftermath of the scandal led to a thorough investigation into the practices and management of the convent. Church officials sought to restore trust and ensure that such atrocities would never occur again. Changes were implemented, including stricter oversight and transparency within the convent. Involvement of outside authorities helped to ensure that justice was served. The convent underwent significant reforms, and those responsible for their actions faced consequences for their sins. Sister Maria, now disillusioned with the corruption she had witnessed, made the difficult decision to leave the convent and seek a different path. The town of Santun Broho, once known for its religious fervor, now found itself grappling with the aftermath of the scandal. Some individuals turned away from the church, disillusioned by the actions of those who were supposed to be their spiritual guides. Others, however, saw the scandal as an opportunity for introspection and renewal of their own faith. The scandal also prompted a broader conversation about the role and power dynamics within religious institutions. Questions were raised about the authority bestowed upon individuals within the church and the potential for abuse of that power. It sparked a movement for greater accountability and transparency within religious organizations, urging them to uphold their sacred duty to protect and guide their followers. For the nuns involved in the scandal, their lives were forever altered. Some faced legal consequences for their actions, while others experienced deep remorse and sought forgiveness. The scandal shattered the illusion of sanctity that had surrounded them, forcing them to confront the consequences of their choices. As the years passed, the scandal of the nuns of Santun Broho gradually faded from the public's memory. The town and the church worked to rebuild trust and restore their reputation. Lessons were learned, and steps were taken to ensure that such a dark chapter in their history would never be repeated. Sister Maria's journey had forever changed her, but she held on to a glimmer of hope that amidst the darkness, true faith and righteousness could still be found. She dedicated herself to helping those affected by the scandal, providing solace and guidance to those who had lost their way. The story of the nuns of Santun Broho serves as a cautionary tale, a reminder that even in the most revered and holy places, corruption can fester. It is a testament to the strength and resilience of those who seek truth and justice, even when faced with the darkest of secrets. And in the end, it is a story of redemption, as Sister Maria finds her own path to healing and renewed faith. It also reminds the townspeople of the importance of remaining vigilant questioning authority when necessary, and demanding accountability from those in power.
In the end, the scandal of the nuns of Santun Broho became a turning point for the town and its people. It ignited a collective awakening, prompting a re-evaluation of their faith, their values, and their commitment to holding those in positions of authority accountable. The story serves as a reminder that even in the face of darkness, the light of truth and justice can prevail, leading to healing, renewal, and a stronger community. Thanks for watching. Do like, subscribe and comment.